policy. So we said that perhaps we'll start with Oscar. I mean, Mr. Secretary of, you know, just to give a little uh, more kind of high-level policy perspective to give a little opening, and then we would go through all the four projects. And I was asking kind of three, because we are now many, so mm -hmm. maybe three to five minutes, just snapshot. Can you please introduce your project and what is the impact of what, 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 what is the angle on and so forth? Yes. And uh, then we have Lorraine in the end, uh, maybe <laughs> touching on some of the things that she heard uh, and, and leading us into the policy debate. And then we have all these questions. How can this kind of remote, how can we telco operators, you know, because there's no obvious business case, so what is the right model? Mm -hmm. And then we have the government, so what's the role of the government um, as well? Okay. Okay. Can I use uh, three slides, or is that uh, difficult? Is there a, I have, because I used them yesterday, I think I have quite good. I think Juan is there, yeah. I think the slides are. Lorraine? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and then we have. Sorry? <laughs> I will do the very good pronunciation. Exactly. Rantanen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Zarpani, Panerje um, Belur. Oh my God, I'm gonna murder these names. Kristen, I'm so sorry. Yeah, exactly. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, I think, the first session in the morning, so uh, we are very pleased that you have uh, made it all the way here from your <laughs> beds, effectively. Um, and we're hoping for a dynamic discussion uh, today on this very important topic of closing the digital gap for marginalized communities. And we have a very uh, impressive and, um, well, dynamic, I hope, panel here. Um, we have slightly more speakers than we initially planned, but I think the fact that uh, we are trying to uh, focus on um, project examples will give uh, some color and, and uh, well, energy to this discussion. So, closing the digital divide is, of course, still a major issue, um, and it's issue in Europe, Latin America and beyond. This session is organized by ourselves, so ETNO is the European Telecommunication and Network Operators Association, and by ASIET, who is our counterpart in, in uh, Latin America. But, and I think the fact that us, the telecommunication uh, associations, are also uh, looking at this issue, it really brings together hopefully, hopefully all our efforts, so, so the fact that Governments are, of course, trying to connect rural areas, remote areas. Uh, we have community initiatives uh, who are trying to make this happen, and also then us from the private sector, from the operator community, who are hoping to be able to support these uh, projects um, well, with, with, with more resources and, and um, effort going forward. So we will be focusing in this session on good practices. We hope it to be concrete. And then also from those good practices that uh, you will hear today, to address some of the key questions. So address some of the key questions at policy level, address the, some of the key questions in terms of collaboration. So how can us operators collaborate with community projects? What is the role of governments um, in this equation and, and so forth? And I, would, I see uh, some familiar faces in the audience, and I know that some of you are very uh, also active in, uh, in the community network projects, so we're also hoping for your participation and your active questions from the audience. So after the first round, we will open it for questions. Uh, we also, I think, have a remote um, way of uh, submitting questions, so you can, you can use that too. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our panel, and we will uh, kick off with the short round of uh, statements from all our panelists. So we have um, on my right hand side, Mr. Oscar Gonzalez from the Argentinian, uh, Argentinian ICT Secretariat. He's the Under Secretary of Regulation in Argentina mm -hmm. and is looking specifically on remote area connectivity issues as well. Then we have uh, Ms. Sharbani Belur from India, the Indian Institute of technology, and she's a senior research scientist there and has been involved uh, herself in many rural community projects in India, so she will talk from that example. Then we have Mr. Christoph Steck, uh, Director of Public Policy at Telefonica, and Christoph will talk about a specific project that Telefonica has been involved in in Peru, in Latin America. We have on my left-hand side Ms. Lorraine uh, Borsiunkula, from the OECD. So OECD is, of course, a kind of policy-making think tanky institution, and Lorraine will be addressing some of the analyses that they have done um, on remote area connectivity. We have Mr. Matthew Rantanen, uh, for who has uh, been involved um, uh, in projects with indigenous communities in, in um, the United States. And finally, uh, we have Mr. Ucha Seturi, who is leading various community uh, project efforts in the Republic of Georgia in the Caucasus area. So what we will do is that we will, I would like to ask Mr. Gonzalez to start from a kind of governmental perspective to give us a high level understanding on what is the role of uh, remote connectivity um, in the kind of governmental rearm, and then we will move on to our project examples to actually understand what can be done and what has been done. So, Oscar, please. Good morning. Is, is this fine? Yes. Thank you very much. I will try to be brief. 
as uh, the intent of uh, uh, the colleagues here in the panel is to, to have an open discussion and exchange. But uh, first of all, I, I wanted to, to say I'm very happy to be here this morning. I understand that uh, access to broadband remains the main challenge for all the multi-stakeholders in the internet uh, community. Though competition and market uh, models have uh, helped us to, to develop greatly over the last years, there are geographic regions and uh, also sectors of our societies, especially in developing countries like Argentina, that uh, remain difficult to, to bring access to. So half of the world population is still offline and uh, that means really a lot and as I said to us is the main challenge that re remains to be, to be solved by the internet community. Uh, over the last four years in Argentina we have uh, generated uh, two million fixed broadband access. We have uh, brought 4G to coverage to 90%, close to 90% of the population, and we have increased the fiber to the home network access from 1.8% 1, 1 to 10% over the last three years. But that's, not, uh, that's clearly not enough, and that's where policy and regulation comes into place, and I would like to, to mention a, a few examples of what we have been doing uh, in order to, to help to bring access to those that are still uh, without it. Uh, I think it is very important to, to have a close cooperation between the public and the private sector as a policy guideline. I think states for these uh, regions and these uh, communities that are still without access have a key role to play and uh, we have understood that and uh, made a, an important investment to develop a backbone network of uh, over 30,000 kilometers. As you probably know, Argentina is the eighth largest geography in the world. So the state has, has put enormous efforts to develop a backbone network that brings uh, fiber and connectivity to the, to the small towns and community where the market is failing to, to attend. And to complement that, we have also used universal service funds and uh, developed a set of programs to, to give subsidies to small uh, enterprises, cooperatives, and uh, we have started to, to work also with community networks but uh, unfortunately, that is a step that uh, is not concluded yet. So, public or state investment, universal service funds through different programs for, for small communities have been the, the, two, the two tools we have used to bring access to, to isolated geographic regions, small communities, small towns, etc. And then it comes regulation, and I think in terms of regulation, there is a lot to do. First of all, I think it's very important to simplify regulations and uh, help those who want to develop projects and develop networks to access the market we have worked on simplifying all the licensing regulations and we have granted 1,200 licenses over the last four years. We have worked with the community networks and created a specific regime for, for them so they don't have to, to pay to the government licenses fees and simplify the requirements to access the, the licensing. We also introduced in the interconnection rules some concepts about the internet uh, exchange points in order to recognize the internet exchange points as, as part of the interconnection 
system. And then we have worked greatly on spectrum access. Uh, we develop or we regulated the concept of shared spectrum. We have been working quite a bit with the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance uh, to not only to, to use the so-called Wi-Fi bands, but also explore the possibility of TV white spaces, which could be a good solution in, in terms of rural connectivity. Um, so I would, I would say licensing interconnection spectrum as uh, some areas of uh, uh, regulatory development that need to be addressed to help develop uh, rural connectivity, and then public investment and the efficient use of uh, universal service funds as policy tools also to, to help uh, bring connectivity to the places and the people that uh, the market is, is failing to do so far. I would like to, to close here and, and then we can go, go back to, to some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. That was very clear. So we heard uh, key governmental tools, public investment, uh, universal service funds, specific regimes for community networks, and the whole spectrum discussion on um, how to facilitate access to spectrum to, to also smaller players. That's great. Uh, Sharbani, would you like to follow now? I would like to propose we now hear from our project examples and um, uh, try and understand so what is, has been done um, in different parts of the world in terms of community connectivity and perhaps also to highlight what are the key challenges that are being tackled and, and that are being encountered in the different parts of the world. So Sharbani, would you like to start please? Uh, thank you, Marit. Um, uh, yeah, so I am a senior research scientist at uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and um, we work. Uh, I work in a project which is known as Gram Marg, uh, Gram Marg or the road towards uh, the village. So we work on enabling uh, connectivity to the remote rural villages of India. Uh, this has been an ongoing project since the year 2012, and um, I have been involved in this project uh, for the past five years. Uh, Grammark, uh, as such, has been uh, being in the Department of Electrical Engineering at, I at IIT Bombay, uh, was focusing initially on technology interventions to connect the unconnected. Um, and uh, so we have worked on uh, the TV white space uh, to enable uh, connectivity to seven villages, uh, seven, seven rural villages, remote rural villages, uh, very close by to Mumbai, um, not very far away from Mumbai, but yet unconnected. Uh, so we connected that. Um, after that, we connected 25 villages, uh, uh, wherein we, uh, we, uh, we did not do it on TV white space because we did not get a light license for it. Um, so we did it on 5.8 gigahertz in the unlicensed band and uh, we set up community-led networks there. So that was the first time when the community themselves wanted to own the network. And uh, that was the moment when um, it, it made me realize that, yeah, I mean, why should we connect, uh, why should we just give them connectivity when they don't even know how to use the connectivity? And uh, communities themselves came up to me and told that, uh, can we own the connectivity now? But they did not have enough ownership to it um, at that project. Uh, later, uh, for the past uh, uh, year and a half, I have been working on a project with Association for Progressive Communications. And uh, this is a project where we are enabling connectivity that is meaningful and sustainable connectivity to the remote rural villages, again, to a tribal population of, uh, say, 2,500 2, population size in a completely remote location, which, is, which does not even have um, a telecom operator over there. So uh, here, why, what do I mean by meaningful, sustainable connectivity is that we enable connectivity only when the community wants the connectivity. But before that, we enable other facilities for them. Like, for example, try to make, try to make them understand or let them talk about it, that what are they going to do with the connectivity. After we enable connectivity, there is no use in telling them, OK, come on, let's learn English. Let's, uh, let's learn how to operate the smartphone. 
No. So, um, so we have identified identified problems or identified problems along with the community, and uh, now we have set up the uh, connectivity there. We don't enable connectivity to the entire village. It's only at one location in the village where we have enabled the connectivity. And at that location, the banking facilities and the e-governance services are enabled by a, um, by a village level entrepreneur and a banking correspondent at that location. So sh because the villagers had to travel 12 kilometers, they walked down 12 kilometers to the city to, enable, uh, to, uh, to even withdraw money from the bank. There are no banks there because there is no connectivity. So this is, and the rest of the network is offline network, which is like, uh, which is wherein they are building up on local knowledge. So local knowledge that they have, indigenous knowledge related to seeds, related to art and craft, related to anything that is there indigenous with the communities, and they focus on that uh, in the local knowledge creation in the offline network. And through this, they are also making products of their own, uh, art and craft, paintings, bamboo craft, paper mesh masks, and others, which is being sold in, the, in an e-commerce platform made for them. So we are actually making the connectivity meaningful for them and also sustainable. So the money that comes in from the e-commerce platform goes back to the community, and that's how the community um, looks into uh, or um, uh, sustains the connectivity over there. The challenges that we have are uh, quite a lot because still now there is no telecom operator over there. Geo has not Reliance Geo has not reached that location. Um, but uh, we are trying to work with the local ISP. So the local internet service provider, we are trying to work with them. But we are also working on a SIM card based cellular router solution, which can enable the connectivity at only one location. Uh, I will be happy to um, get questions from you and answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you raised a very important point with the, the whole demand side engagement. So, so doing it with the community rather than just for the community. So I'm sure we'll have more questions on that later. Christoph, would you like to take the floor next, please? Yeah, thanks. Thanks and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I have uh, three or four slides, uh, which I think um, if you can put them up, that would be helpful um, because I think it explains a little bit. Uh, it's easier to explain the case um, I'm going to present to you from Peru. Um, I work for Telefonica. Telefonica is, a, is an, an operator. Uh, we operate uh, networks in, in Europe and in Latin America. Um, so we are in developed markets and emerging economies. Um, and I will show you now a project which comes from Peru, which is uh, in the latter category and where you have very similar issues to the one we just uh, talked about and heard about. Um, that there are um, still uh, a lot of uh, regions and people not connected. And so we started um, more than two years ago uh, with an idea of creating Internet para todos, uh, which is a pure um, wholesale um, operator in the rural countryside. So it's, a, uh, it's an operator offering services to everyone who wants to use the network. Um, and it's at the same time uh, not publicly funded. Um, it's funded actually by uh, four partners currently. That's ourselves. It's uh, Facebook, and it's um, there are two development banks, uh, CAF and Bit in Latin America, regional development banks, and they also um, are basically the ones who uh, have started the company. So that's a company uh, specialized on rural access um, and doing it in a in an open wholesale model. So I will just. Uh, um, show you a little bit what's behind that. Um, I mean, the, the idea, of course, is to build connectivity in, in remote areas where currently um, there is no connectivity, and there's also work on areas where there is um, not a very good connectivity. I think we have to um, kind of separate these two areas because there are different um, challenges around them. Uh, we have quite um, ambitious, I think, targets. Uh, we're trying to get um, the capex, that means the capital investment in networks down uh, by 50%, um, um, because we feel that one of the key reasons why there's no connectivity in, in these areas is, of course, that the deployment of networks is too expensive. Um, at the same time, sometimes the buying uh, power, of course, is also not very high. So basically, you have to, you have to build, you know, first of all, um, a, a business, a commercial model that you can offer connectivity there. It's, of course, not sometimes uh, people think 
<laughs> companies, big companies don't want to give connectivity. Of course, we would love to give connectivity to everyone. I mean, that's our business model. And that's what we've done to, to 350 million people already um, in our markets. Um, but um, as I said, sometimes the, the business models um, need innovation and we need to work on that. Um, what we, what we did, I think, quite interesting here is that we innovated in various aspects. Um, first of all, as I said, we tied up with um, other companies and, and other organizations. That's not very common in our sector. Uh, we still tend to have um, more the idea of, uh, of course, vertical integration and of uh, um, that we operate our own networks. Um, so here we have kind of set up um, a kind of alliance um, and it's, it's open, of course, to others to join. Um, we have also, um, I think, innovated quite a lot on the technology, technology side. So we have, for example, uh, just uh, signed an agreement with uh, Google regarding the Loon project. Um, so in Peru, actually, in the very remote areas, which is the area of the Amazonas in, in Peru, um, which is uh, really hard to reach and, and it's very sparsely populated, um, we are going to cooperate with uh, Google Loon to provide connectivity there um, with the balloons, um, which is, um, I think, one of the very first, if not the first, um, uh, really commercial use of, of uh, that kind of technology. Um, so we are really open to any technology, any idea uh, we can find um, to do that. We have also uh, innovated on technology in the sense that the planning of the network, I think, uh, has been changed. So, for example, one of the issues for us is that we don't know exactly where the demand is. So sometimes it's hard to uh, know before, you know, if there's a specific area where there would be a demand. I mean, you can guess it by people and so on, but it's, it's easier if you have more data. So one of the things um, we did with Facebook was that Facebook could provide us a nominalized data um, and they could say, you know, we know that in that area, for example, people own smartphones. Um, and that's an indicator, for example, that there will be a demand once we build connectivity. So we could really kind of pinpoint this, these islands of demand um, and could go there first and provide connectivity. That, that's very good for a business because you could immediately, you get immediately a kind of return on the investment. So um, people get quite, um, quite motivated to build more connectivity <laughs> once you have that. So basically, um, these, these are the the innovation on the technology side. Uh, we also innovated on the operational side. Um, we, for example, also cooperate with community networks um, and, and work with them for the, for the marketing, but also sometimes for maintenance of this network. Um, because one of the reasons sometimes uh, hard for us to operate these networks in very remote areas is that it's not that easy to provide them uh, technical support. Um, and so we can basically um, tie up with, with communities there and, and try, to, um, try to work together on that. So we also kind of did things different on that operational side. And finally, I think there was also um, innovation done on the regulatory side by the, the regulator in Peru. Um, they provided um, the right regulatory conditions uh, to build such a specific operator um, just for the rural countryside with open uh, access. Um, I mean, just to give you an idea, as I said, what the challenge is we see in Peru, and that's very similar to other countries in Latin America as well, it's just an example. There are around 6 million people still um, without internet access or mobile broadband. Um, we, we have, you can basically say that half of them live in areas where there basically needs to be done an overlay. So there's technology maybe available, but it's not very good quality. It's going to be um, out, of, um, out of service very soon because it relies on, on um, old fashioned technologies. So basically we, we have the challenge to build what we call an overlay network, which uh, gives 4G connectivity in these uh, areas. These are the, the blue spots you see here. And then you have um, whatever thinks about the green field, as we call it. There is no voice service, um, no data services, nothing, no connectivity at all. Um, and that's more, uh, more or less 3 million people as well. So in the overlay areas, um, it's sometimes easier because you have already some form of infrastructure installed. You have 2G usually um, infrastructure uh, up and running, um, at least one. So you have uh, towers, you have electricity and all these kind of things. Um, so the challenge here is just to update technology. Um, in the greenfield areas, sometimes we have to, we have to go uh, even a step further. Um, we have to provide connectivity using solar energy and so on. It's uh, more of a challenge. You don't have the backbone um, and the transport capacities there. Um, so that's really complicated and, and, and that's even more challenging than the first. But both things are very important because in the end both kind of uh, are important for, uh, for connectivity. 
Um, so just to give you a couple of, of first um, indicators, uh, we launched five months ago. Um, we have connected half a million um, new kind of 4G clients already, built around 500 4G sites for that, connected, um, uh, connected uh, in total 1 million people. And what we found that's interesting is that the average revenue per users, the APU as we call it, um, is higher than uh, basically uh, we've seen before. So, I mean, it's quite a positive sign that there is um, more than people expect um, also buying power in these areas. Um, that's, of course, a, a, a good news for everyone because in the end it gives um, a motivation for commercial operators to go into that areas. Um, and we, ha we plan to get to 4 million connected people in the next two years. Um, so that's basically then uh, more or less two-thirds of what I just showed you of the unconnected in Peru. Um, I, I have a, a little video. Um, I'm not sure if you can put it on just to give you an idea. I'm, I, I think it's in Spanish, but you can put subtitles in YouTube uh, in English. Um, I, I hope it works. It gives you a little impression of, it's not working. You have to pinch on the picture. It's not there. <laughs> No, okay, don't worry. Okay. If you Google for it, I mean, um, it's, it's, uh, it's on, on YouTube. Um, Internet Paratoros is the name. And um, as we said, I think we, we're quite fascinated about it because it's the first time, I think, uh, we have seen um, a, a privately um, invested and run um, operation specifically for the rural countryside and, and offering uh, open holds and access to, to everyone who wants to use that network. <laughs> Um, and we are, we are seeing that it's working quite well. So I think it's an alternative model we just want to present here. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Um, I think from our side, the operator's side, this is indeed very uh, interesting, and it would be later uh, interesting to hear how you see this kind of, um, well, operators to, to, to have operators more closely involved in the community networks working out. Mm -hmm. And I think the big gain potentially is the fact that, of course, operators as private sector have a lot of experience in the business case and sustainability aspects. So could the involvement of operators in a way um, help scale the community networks and also make them more sustainable, but we'll come to that later. Next, I would like to ask Matt, would you like to talk about your projects? Thanks. Thank you. So, my name is Matthew Rantanen. I am the Director of Technology for the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association, and that is 20 federal, federally recognized tribes in the United States uh, in Southern California. Um, I'm also the partnering and business development uh, for a new project or new company called Arcadian Infracom. And it's a, a fiber, a dark fiber builder in the United States. And I'll talk about both of these a little bit. But um, specifically to the unserved community, uh, building the model from the, from the bottom up, um, we, we started in 2001 building a network that supports uh, these 20 communities in Southern California. And there's, there's roughly 8,900 people spread out across 20 different land masses. And we built a microwave network that, that uses um, every available unlicensed spectrum uh, in the United States that is uh, free to use for, for public access. And then we actually have licensed some links to, um, to do some long haul to avoid interference and then um, enable ourselves to free up the unlicensed space to do, um, to do multi-point deployment. So our network spans uh, over 650 miles, and to drive a car, it's, uh, it takes two hours to get from the, the beginning to the end of the network. Um, for, the, for the longest time, we only had um, access at one end of the network, so the network design was you know, a single point of failure anywhere along the route. Uh, if it broke, everybody behind the brake would not work. Um, the last three years, we've actually achieved um, a second access to the rest of the internet. Uh, we have fiber now at both ends. We have 10 gigs of fiber at each end of the network, and then we deploy everything in the middle with, with wireless. This was a community effort that was paired with private funding and uh, university knowledge in the beginning in 2001. And it was an opportunity brought to the tribes uh, about connecting their resource programs and, and after school programs and um, evolved into a wireless internet service provider um, business, if you will, that is run by the tribal governments. It is a community network of sorts. Uh, I know it's sometimes a conflict to call that a community network, but a tribe 
a tribe is self-contained in the United States. They're a sovereign entity and they have um, a government and a, an education system and a library and a, you know, a fire department and, and police and they do um, basically everything for themselves. So the, the network that they're gonna build is gonna serve multi-purposes and it is based in their community. Uh, it acts as a community network and it's operated by the community but it, it is a little bit different model than some of the community networks that we talked about today. And you know, we've run into the, many obstacles in policy, uh, regulation, um, partnerships with carriers uh, along the way. There's, you know, there's, there's hurdles and barriers to entry for tribal communities in the United States. There are um, 573 federally recognized tribes, of which um, none had internet, you know, when we started this project back in, back in 2001. And um, the other company that I'm a part of uh, builds long haul fiber and we have announced currently 2,500 miles of fiber, but we're doing a unique approach to this, and that is to connect um, commercial data centers in, in large cities, but along the route uh, of, of development, we're, we're dragging the, the line of fiber 50 to 100 miles left and right along that path to be able to include all of the reservations that are um, that are along that path, as well as small towns throughout the rural United States, which are also lacking in connectivity. So it, it's a unique approach. It's a top-down approach. So I'm actually getting to work from both from both angles uh, to be able to solve this problem and and change the landscape. I'll leave it at that until questions. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, we have our fourth and uh, final project example. We have uh, Ucha Seturi from uh, the Republic of Georgia, and uh, he will talk about. Uh, mountain communities uh, specifically. So please, Ucha. Thanks, Marit, um, for inviting. Um, I'm Ucha Satori, I'm from Georgia, and I'm working for uh, mountain community networks, but uh, my regular job is uh, I'm working for Small and Medium Enterprise Association of Georgia as a ESP association for micro and small guys. Uh, what can I tell about two projects actually because uh, <clears throat> in 2015 uh, with support of Internet Society we did one project in Tusheti uh, Highlands and covered about 45 villages near the Russian border and also um, but in this project we had um, two main stakeholders, two supporters uh, first of all Internet Society as a main supporter and <coughs> government and they did this awareness rising uh, activity for locals, um, for e-commerce and etc. Uh, and just one year ago we um, had and we started another project um, in a different area of Georgia, is also near the Russian border, near the Chechnya and Ingusheti actually. So uh, we had uh, here uh, up to 100 villages, uh, 1,400 square kilometers of the territory, um, up to 20 gorges, uh, two passes, uh, and all, not all, but most of our sites are on the high slopes of Caucasian mountains, more than 3,000 meters from the sea level. Uh, we have, uh, as, I, as I told, uh, 100 uh, villages, about six schools, not six schools, also border guards, and this area is protected area um, and near the border, as I told. Um, another interesting point is the stakeholders uh, of the project, and um, Mike mentioned about it. We have in this project, it's a replica of Tusheti project, and this is Pshawin, Khersureti, and Kudamagari projects. Sorry for this interesting Georgian ABC. Uh, and in this project, we have 11 stakeholders. First of all, this is Internet Society as a beginner and uh, mind player of the project. Uh, who is giving mind points and directions uh, for us. Uh, second interesting and very important uh, donor is the government. And they, uh, they gave half of the money and not uh, like uh, money from the uh, fund and et cetera. It's a just donation, direct donation from community networks. Uh, another main stakeholder is the uh, third biggest mobile operator uh, as an in-kind supporter. They gave 
free access on the mass, it's just half of, not half, maybe 10% of, but anyways, they gave from 10 years for free with electricity, with free collocation, with space, with everything. Uh, we have also my association as an uh, organization who have to help uh, local society organization mounting community network for three years with trainings, with legal support, with economics, with everything, with regulatory body, whatever. We have also two local uh, vendors and other private companies from my association. So we have more than 11 uh, vendors in this project and uh, I think it's, it could be more interesting uh, for uh, the people in the audience because we have quite good supporters, quite important supporters, government and uh, big uh, mobile operators. Uh, we have two main challenges actually, the weather and mother nature because it's, it's, yeah, it's huge, it's a big highlands, uh, isolated, so the roads are just open for f four months. So this connection is crucial for locals and uh, from the next year we have to finish all our final uh, destinations and we start an another uh, related project with awareness rising. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Ucha. So I, I hear that uh, in Georgia we've had a positive experience both in terms of collaboration with government, uh, in terms of funding and also the kind of uh, regulatory approach, but also then with uh, vendors and telco sector, which is, which is a great thing. So it seems all that it's coming together. Now, having heard the four examples here, I, uh, I would like to ask Lorraine from the OECD to, to, to well, to, to give your impressions on, on the discussion so far and based on your analysis that you've done at the OECD, does the, the different challenges and, and uh, things that have been discussed here, does that correspond with your analysis and anything else that you would like to highlight? Hi, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Lor Lorraine Prasunkula. I work at the OECD. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and our objective is to promote good policies uh, for better, better policies for better lives. And what we do is to, at the OECD, we're, we're known for collecting data uh, and, uh, and producing analysis on different topics. I work in the Science and Technology Innovation uh, Directorate, specifically with communications infrastructure and services. And um, a lot of, of what I've heard here today and in previous uh, IGF sessions relates a lot to the work that we've been doing. So I, I, I like to make three main points uh, today in the session. Uh, the first one is um, on, on a principle of uh, fostering private investment first and using public money later. So by private investment, uh, I mean both by small and, uh, and large service providers from either business or associations or, or tribal communities, for example. But the idea is simple, is that the more geographic areas uh, that are served by market forces, uh, the less demand there will be for scarce public resources that need to be allocated to meet public policy objectives. Um, policies, for example, to promote competition, private investment, uh, and independent regulation have been very successful in OECD countries and non-OECD countries. Um, to increase the size of the pie of the people that are actually covered by broadband services. Um, so what if, uh, if there isn't sufficient investment and people are still left uncovered? The answer is first, try to think about solutions on how to foster more private investment. Uh, and there are several, uh, several tools available for governments to do that. And some of them were mentioned um, previously by by Oscar Gonzalez from Argentina, but for several other uh, uh, players here as well. So I, I wouldn't uh, be doing justice to, to my organization if I didn't say, first, we need data, and we need to understand the, the gaps that actually exist in terms of quality and affordable access uh, to broadband. Because without that, there, there can be no real assessment on the size of the issue, uh, and therefore no, no evidence policy making. Uh, moreover, it's very important that countries focus on uh, streamlining administrative procedures and, uh, and, the, uh, and the example Argentina was mentioned, for example, in terms of uh, simplifying regulation, uh, in terms of eliminating administrative redundancies, uh, uh, but also implementing DIG1 policies and common regulations for the laying down cables 
across municipal and regional roads. Um, and, and that's with a view of establishing a uniform um, practice uh, in, in, uh, across the country. Moreover, it's also very important that we enhance um, the access to resources from network operators. Um, and that was mentioned again in the discussion today. So existing barriers, for example, uh, of accessing passive infrastructure from backhaul to poles to ducts, uh, but also restrictive rights of way uh, should be eliminated. Um, and, uh, and, it's, and of course, another issue that was mentioned is sufficient spectrum, uh, which is, is very crucial. It's, it's crucial to reduce deployment costs from both uh, fixed and, and, and broadband networks. Um, and only once the steps have actually been explored and the size of the pie of the people that lack quality and affordable uh, access uh, to broadband is reduced, should there be public investment? Um, and good practices exist also in terms of both um, municipal networks, and we have several examples uh, in, uh, in, in OECD countries such as Sweden uh, that have, uh, have had a lot of investment in public networks, um, but also in terms of national broadband strategies, in terms of how to use efficiently uh, universal service funds in order not to distort the market. Um, the second point that I'd like to make is in terms of um, the tech de developments that will continue to disrupt not only business models, but also regulation. Uh, so in terms of uh, technological developments, I mean the convergence of networks to IP networks, um, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything and how much it will drive demand for more infrastructure, for fiber, for, uh, for more backhaul but also augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, blockchain, and all sorts of crowdsourced and decentralized solutions. Um, so uh, a very recent study that we did in the OECD uh, looks into operator models in the future. And uh, one of the things that we analyzed is that, that there's, today there's no single entity that provides all communications infrastructure and services. And this has led to the development of what uh, we categorized as, as four macro uh, types of operator business models. The first one being the traditional vertically integrated operators, the second being uh, cable operators, third, wholesale only operators, uh, and many of them utility ones, and the fourth, internet companies that are more and more investing in infrastructure. Interestingly, what we found is that both traditional vertically uh, integrated operators and cable operators are innovating the business models. They are expanding to different areas uh, that can be from financial services, banking, to uh, some sorts of data analysis or even business consultancy for firms and small and medium firms, for, for example. Uh, cable operators uh, in the OECD comprise of around 32% of broadband um, subscriptions and they're also advancing in different areas. But we see a lot of new uh, developments in terms of wholesale uh, provision of broadband services and that was mentioned uh, in, in many of the, uh, on the examples uh, today, such as the, the case uh, of Internet Para Todos in Peru. And, uh, and what's important to think, why it's important to think about that is because that will impact regulation so regulation will need, because of technological developments, they will need to be more responsive and it will, be need, to, will need to be constructed based on interactive approach. And, and policy makers, in our view, will, uh, would really benefit from uh, fostering regulatory sandboxes where both small and large business, uh, uh, businesses can really prototype new approaches in different region areas. And the third point that I'd like to make, and I think that's very relevant for this session because it focuses in isolated communities, is that uh, we need to, to weight regulation and really shift from one size fits all regulation to data driven and, and perhaps a segmented approach. Uh, and, and also looking to outcome based regulation in terms of focusing on results and performance instead of just focusing on the form. And finally, uh, the point that I'd like to make is on, in terms of collaborative regulation um, on different levels. So understanding both the local 
uh, needs, and especially rural and isolated communities, and also fitting that into national regulation. In, in the same way, we, we need good international practices to expand digital inclusion in underserved areas. So engaging with a broader set of stakeholders from both uh, uh, local communities uh, to, to international organizations is very crucial to, to further promote connectivity. So those are my points. Thank you, Lorraine. So uh, what I heard there is that um, business models play a key role and we need to kind of uh, consider the whole range of, of uh, possibilities. You also highlighted the technical development. So, you know, we cannot be restrained to the current technologies that we have, but we need to also consider the future, future potential. And then, then the regulatory impact and how can we uh, regulate it or if it will be useful and, and to what extent should, should it be centralized or could it be localized? So what I would like to do now, I think we've, we've touched on many aspects on, on the supply side, you know, how do we provide access? Uh, we have touched a bit on the demand side on, well, we need to also have the communities on board and, and think about skills and such things. What I would like to do is to see if you have any questions to our very competent panel at this stage from the audience. Uh, as we said, we would like this to be an interactive session. So any questions at this stage? Uh, we have two questions here and, well, we have four questions, so do we have a microphone uh, in the room? Ah, they're around the table. Okay, we have some in the back rows, if you could then just step up. But maybe we'll start from here with the two gentlemen. Please introduce yourself and um, ask a question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Grigory Grigoryev. I represent uh, <laughs> Africa Partners Initiative. It's a German uh, membership organization. Um, my question is, across the whole panel actually. Uh, it's more of, um, um, it goes into technology as well as uh, project-based. Uh, so we're providing um, access to communication. So it's basically, it seems like it's a lot of people that are gonna be consumers of information. So my question is when you go to these and try to implement these projects, how much discussion is going on into creating actual uh, knowledge hubs? Uh, how much are you informing them or providing them information in terms of that they can become, I would say, nodes in this networked world. And it would be interesting to see, particularly with, with regards to technology, in terms of uh, how much servers or technology building, as well as uh, projects in the US, I think it'd be interesting. Thank you. Okay, so uh, knowledge hubs and, and, and the role of technology. I'll take another one, uh, and then we go back to the panel, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mathieu Latarin. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Bonn. Uh, my question is more directly to Matthew of uh, what you uh, talked about, the tribal community. Um, could, could you a little bit explain further that what, when you use the word community, what it actually means? What is the, the concept or the construct or the structure of a community over there? And when you say it's a community-based initiative or a community in initiative, uh, is that wholly, completely done by the community, or is it more of assistance, or it's only community initiative? Could you put some light on that? Thank you. Very good. Um, we'll take two more questions. I think, uh, lady there, uh, if you could come up front, and then I'll take one more there, and then we go back to the panel, and we'll do another round after. Thanks. Yes. Good morning, I'm Diana van der Stelt from uh, Maximianza IT uh, Solutions Foundation from uh, Ghana. We are deploying um, integrated learning transformation programs for schools all over the country and we are about to uh, also expand to other West African countries. So we come to villages, we bring computers and smart boards to the schools and local networks and then um, we meet people who are angry because they are in the village and they miss the internet. We bring devices, many of them have smartphones and they want the internet to also come. And while we are moving to more and more remote areas, we find ourselves sometimes on our own because uh, we cannot convince the telecom companies to come. So what is the most uh, frugal way to go about it? I'm particularly interested maybe in examples from India because I think there, there may be similar situations where villagers feel they are alone and uh, they don't know how to go about it to do things themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, the panelists, for the elaborated uh, 
presentations that you made. Uh, one thing that uh, I would like to add is that uh, when we talk about the marginalized communities, uh, I think uh, one of them uh, is the people with disabilities. Um, by the way, my name is uh, Dr. Azizi, and uh, I'm a volunteer with the uh, only uh, blind school of Afghanistan, which is the Kabul Blind School, uh, and uh, I work for them and with them uh, for the last 13 years. Uh, I would like to see if any of the panelists have experience uh, working uh, with the uh, blind communities and uh, the visually impaired uh, communities, because in Afghanistan, unfortunately, we have got uh, almost uh, half a million uh, blind uh, people, and uh, uh, from the public sector, unfortunately, there is least attention towards them. So I want to see how we as the nonprofits uh, can uh, engage with these communities and uh, can help them. Thank you very much. Thank you, excellent question. So um, taking stuff, stock of the questions, we had one specifically about Matt, maybe we'll take that um, uh, when, when we come to you, uh, but we had the questions on the knowledge hubs and, and, and creating this type of, uh, uh, well, hubs in, in the communities. We had the question regarding um, demand for telcos, so there is actually demand in villages, but um, the operators are not always willing to invest, and perhaps they, Christoph and Sharbani could, could uh, give some insights. And then we had an excellent question on disability, so how can we integrate this into the approaches regarding connectivity? So who would like to take the floor first to comment? Matt, please go ahead. So specifically to answer your question, a community, a tribal community in the United States is a sovereign dependent of the United States. It's, it's a group of people that are, um, and it's hard to, hard to do this because the United States government took several groups of people and divided them, divided them up the way they saw fit to try to eliminate them in the long run, put them on reservations in places where they they maybe roamed through but didn't specifically live. Um, and they were, you know, set on that land and said, you know, this is where you have to live. You can't live any, anywhere else. You can't leave this land. Um, to become recognized in the United States, uh, we, we did not get recognized as citizens until 1926 um, to be able to vote. And um, the reservations themselves had to develop their own constitution, their own uh, structure of government and a list of people, which they call the federal role, to be enrolled in that community and be a part of that community. So that's the community that is defined as the US government. As we've evolved and worked away from that and gone away from some of those rules, some of those tribal organizations have opened up their role to lineal descendancy, so anybody born underneath that doesn't have to be on the original role. Um, and and one, the other fun thing that the United States government did is, uh, is institute a blood quantum. So if I'm half of this tribe, I can be enrolled in this tribe. If I'm not half, if I drop below half, then I cannot be enrolled kind of a thing. And each tribe is different based on how they structured their constitution, but all suggested by the US government. A lot of tribes have thrown that out and, and just use a lineal descendancy model, which is way better. Uh, it increases their population. It also you know, allows their family to have the same benefits as the original people enrolled. Um, the effort made at, at the community level to create this network. Um, in the 20 communities that I'm a part of, I have been together for 40 some years to be able to strengthen their numbers and, and uh, go after federal subsidies and opportunities uh, with a larger number base. So they work together as one nonprofit tribal organization and they've chosen to work together to stand up an internet company, Tribal Digital Village Network, to be able to actually deploy this on each of their reservations. They did not want to take it on individually. They wanted to work together and actually create an entity that would govern this for them. We still report to the 20 leaders of the tribes, but you know, there is an entity that's developed to do that. Thanks. Uh, Sharbani, Christoph, would you like to uh, comment on the question from West Africa? <laughs> Yeah, um, I would first like to answer about the knowledge hubs. Um, yeah, so in our community network, uh, what we see is that um, it is uh, through the interaction with the community, what we found is that they don't want our knowledge to be given to them. I mean, they know 
already a lot about us and they know that there is a gap between the knowledge that we provide to them and the knowledge that they can access. So what we do is a bottom-up approach and we ask them that can you share your knowledge with us? And, we, and that's the reason why we have put up local access servers and Raspberry Pis in the community through access points. It's like the Raspberry Pi acts as an access point, and all the information in the Raspberry Pi is not only our information that goes into the community, but community is also creating and sharing information into the Raspberry Pi that goes into a local access server that is locally managed through a moderator in the village. So, so these are knowledge hubs of local knowledge that is there within the community. The indigenous community over there, the tribal community, they, don't, they have a lot of knowledge. They know so many, so many things about trees, seeds, art and craft. There are various things that they know. I mean, they don't even go to the hospital to cure their disease. They, they do it in the village itself. So all this knowledge, they don't know how to read and write because they are completely illiterate. They have not gone to school. And they need to have a repository of this knowledge. And that is what is satisfying for them, that such, such type of knowledge hubs if we make for them over there. Uh, to reply to the other comment on uh, Ghana, I would like to tell is that um, in our communities too, we face the problem that people told us that, uh, please bring internet, please bring internet. But, uh, but we always ask them the question that we bring you the internet, but uh, can you pay for the internet? How much can you be able to pay? So we also asked them and they told that, oh yeah, we can pay, we can pay around $5. But then there is a crisis or, uh, I mean this year India had too much rains, Maharashtra had too much rains, the agriculture did not go well, the paddy was uh, completely gone in the rains. So they don't have that income now. So what we have devised is that we have, we, with the community, we have told them that look, you can anyways get the internet if you climb up on a hill, which they always do now. I mean, they are they 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 go to the hill and make a phone call, or they get trickling signals all across the village, so they know at what place in the village that they can get the best signal. I mean, and I have also seen people putting up, uh, putting up their mobile phones on the loft of the house or the terrace in the house so that the phone calls come and they speak on the Bluetooth. So that's also there, I have seen them. But the thing is that you, if you enable them services for which they, are, they have to actually travel to the city, like, you know, for a, for a mayor birth certificate, a death certificate or a marriage certificate, they have to go to the city, walk some 12 kilometers to the city. In, so if you enable those services to them in the village, uh, what we do is through a SIM card based cellular router, and one person takes responsibility of the SIM card. So the SIM card is purchased from a telecom operator, Airtel or Geo, whosever signal is the best in that location, and the services are enabled to the people there. And I think, and the rest of the, uh, rest of the village is completely offline on a local access server and Raspberry Pis acting as Wi-Fi access points. So this is a mix. I think we should not really tell them that, oh, every time 24 into 7 online. But if there is not so much of content which they can produce on the internet, they even cannot read what is there in the internet because the internet is in a language that they don't know how to read. So it's in English, which they don't know how to read. So perhaps we can tell them that, why don't you build the internet with the, in your own language? So something in your own language, that gives them the enthusiasm, that, that gives them the inspiration to work on it. Thanks. Christoph, would you like to add to yeah, that? I would agree to, to all what we just heard. I would just add uh, one thing. I mean, first of all, about the knowledge, I mean, of course, that's uh, very relevant. Um, um, we, we have a foundation, very active foundation, and they're focusing on, on education and, uh, and also on creating startups. And I think that's uh, what, what I liked about your example before is, is that when you t talked about how you created an e-commerce service, which then kind of brings them also, um, you know, some, some of the resources to, to, again, pay for the Internet and so on. So I think that's great because um, very often I'm concerned with 
that we are consuming a lot and not, not reproducing and not regenerating uh, value uh, once the internet is there. So that's one of the, the things I think we, we should all be aware of. Um, and education is key as well. And <clears throat> that brings me to the second part. What can we do? Because uh, I totally share uh, uh, your uh, kind of pain. Uh, we have a huge problem called uh, Pro, uh, Pro Futuro. Um, and that brings digital education to um, in, in many parts of Africa as well. And, and we have the same issue. There's no connectivity and that's very complicated. So what can you do? I think the, the best way is really to do a collaborative effort here. I mean, there are things like national broadband plans set up in, in many countries. And I think if everyone thinks out of the box, uh, you can do a lot of things. Um, usually what you first do in these plans is that you connect uh, specific places like schools and, and hospitals and so on to create um, the first kind of connectivity there. Um, but I think it's important to have really a different attitude. I think that, um, you know, we had issues uh, in the past with regulation. We set up universal, universal service obligations, for example, to operators. Um, that meant that the industry paid money uh, to a specific fund, which then uh, was supposed to be used to build connectivity. Um, the problem is that then, you know, these things get very bureaucratic and then they get uh, outdated. So they, for example, one of the issues in regulation, very simple things uh, we see in many countries is that they are only thought for a specific technology or just for, for example, fixed uh, um, connectivity. And so then, you know, the fund cannot pay out um, the, the money and then, you know, things get stuck. And, and so it's really... Uh, it's not easy to do it. So I would, I would really say the, the best thing is to, to try really to sit down with the industry in, in each country, try to figure out what is the, the real challenge, um, try to see how you can get there and, and, and do a plan. Um, and if everyone uh, supports, if you know, politics and regulation supports the right investment-friendly politics, um, I think there is interest in giving connectivity. And uh, I described to you before how we try to bring down deployment costs um, in, in many, many different ways and you have to really kind of every little thing helps to bring it down and then you can suddenly run a, a network for five dollars um, you know when people can only pay five dollars a, a month and you can run it and you can make it sustainable and, and that's my final word on very often you hear subsidies and that's that's okay i mean subsidies uh, are fine maybe in some areas they're necessary and they can they can help um, having said that, um, I think networks relying on subsidies will not be sustainable, let's be fair. I mean, in, in many of these countries, politics will not support that um, eternally. So you will not have sustainable networks if you, you, you need a model where you depend on subsidies. These need to be um, sustainable in the sense that they generate sufficient uh, funds, sufficient money, revenues to kind of be able to maintain the network and even upgrade it at a certain point of time. What we very often see with subsidies is that they are paid, something is done, and then things get outdated. Because this is not, I mean, this is technology. This is very dynamic environment. Uh, you have to update, you have to maintain the, the networks. Um, it's not easy to do it with, with a one-off kind of initiative. So um, I, I always try to, to make that point because I think it's important to understand that you can, on a commercial basis, have more sustainable um, uh, models in the end, um, and, and subsidies can play a role in that, but I would not build networks relying on subsidies. That is just uh, not, uh, not a good investment in mid to long term. Very good. Um, I would like to also get some reactions to the question from our Afghan colleague on the disabilities, maybe from... Um, Maybe, I don't know if Lorraine or uh, Oscar, from the governmental perspective at the policy level, uh, would start. Um, uh, is this, how do you take this into consideration when, when uh, doing the broadband plans and other things for um, your countries or public policies? Thank you. Uh, I work on the access side of the, uh, of the government, but we do have... Uh, uh, digital inclusion plans in place in other sectors of our government, uh, working on disabilities and also developing uh, digital skills, which I think it was uh, some other questions uh, here in the room. Uh, but I cannot give you any specifics. If you want, we can exchange uh, contacts and I can get back to you with some specific uh, information. Thank you. Ah, okay. uh, for the local knowledge, I think um, 
local knowledge creation that we work on together with the communities there we actually are breaking down all types of barriers so i i i myself know of a of a uncle who is in the village he doesn't he is blind and he but he is a very good musician he plays the 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 indigenous uh, they have it's called the tarpa um and uh, there is no one in that village apart from him who plays the tarpa and uh, he exactly knows where to put uh, i mean where how to how to play it and even how to make a tarpa without without even seeing it so he knows about that so he, we have also asked him to uh, to put up his knowledge about the music and the instrument making in the local access server Lorraine Matt um from um anecdotal level we had uh, recently an analyst work with us in 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 the OECD she's a lawyer expert in AI and she was blind and that was the first time that we uh, we had someone in staff uh, at least in our team on digital uh, uh who was uh uh who was blind and for uh, for us it was quite quite uh, a a benchmark because it made us rethink internal processes within our team and uh and and also to see uh how how important it was the technology for her to to do her job she was doing work on technology and using technology uh clearly every day from a more general level i think this this was a discussion that we've been having in in the OECD in several in several dimensions uh we've been uh uh looking into how we can promote more inclusive policy making and that uh that takes into account uh people with disabilities but also uh uh taking into account the dimension of gender uh, or other vulnerable populations as well and and what's uh crucial in terms of policy making is making sure that these people are represented when you are developing these policies policy makers often do not know what they don't know so it, there's such a gap of knowledge uh and and first going back to the point of data we need more evidence we need to be able to to engage with associations that represent this this particular population so so their uh, so their viewpoints are actually uh, uh represented when policy is being is being done um in the city we're going to go through a process uh where we'll be we have several legal instruments in the organization and we're going through a process where we are reviewing the the broadband the um recommendation of the OECD and one of the aspects aspects that have been uh, raised uh, uh by several countries uh for us is the the aspect of inclusion particularly with people with disabilities uh so we we are a reflection of uh, of the many thoughts that are happening within different OECD countries but also stakeholder groups because we have civil society tech and community community business and trade associations but it, it is it is a crucial point that i believe needs to be uh further um uh made f further cleared in uh clearing uh, in broadband policies so when we originally started in 2001 the concepts of of disabled um access to the internet um specifically specifically blind was was focused on um building websites that had um you know functional code that was allowed to be read very easily by a reader um for um people that were blind so as it as time evolved i our original network administrator michael peralta um only had one functioning eye and his one functioning eye was failing and his health was degrading and he was legally blind by the time he passed and he um it made us very aware of of the the issues involved with with that impairment and then uh building a network and i would say the evolution of of the internet of things um has really focused that you have to have access to internet you have to have access to a wifi bubble in your living space because then you can access the internet of things that makes that lifestyle um you know more functional for you because there are a lot of a lot of tools out there to make life better and more uh more interactive um without sight 
that are developed, but if you do not have access, there is the barrier. Um, so that's you know what we're working with today, and, and that's kind of the extent of it. Very good, thanks very much. Um, I would like to also now perhaps take another round of questions. We still have a bit of time. We had some questions left there. Do we have any further questions at this stage? Vasilis, uh, we have one here and another. So let's take these four questions. Perhaps you would like to start as you were first on the line. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Nicolas Pache. I am part of the Association for Progressive Communications. And I have several, so thank you very much for a very uh, rich uh, set of conversations that have brought so many questions to the table. Uh, first, uh, I'm interested in both uh, Oscar and Christian have mentioned uh, Universal Service Fund. And, um, and I am uh, interested in, uh, in knowing something that uh, a colleague of mine, Steve Song, I guess many of you know about him, uh, he speaks about, and this is both for Universal Service Fund and for regulation, he speaks about uh, the, a jar of stones. Like, and it's about how uh, different markets can be regulated at different, in different ways for different uh, levels of provision. You know, like, uh, for example, in the uh, food market, we have a set of regulations that apply to uh, wholesale uh, vendors. And then we have a set of regulations that uh, regulate the supermarkets, the small ones, and then uh, another set of regulations that's, uh, that regulate kiosks. And, and then there's another one set of regulations that, uh, that uh, regulate the uh, people that sell on the streets. And uh, you can't apply the rules that go for the wholesale people to the ones that sell in the streets and the other way around. But you understand that the, in order to get to have the full coverage to have plenty of uh, 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 service for everyone at the food level, you, you want to have different levels of um, regulation, different kinds of regulation. But you want to support them all in their activities. Uh, and I guess uh, from the uh, regulatory perspective and also how you uh, invest the resources that are that look to, to bridge the digital gap because Universal Service Fund is, uh, funds are, around the world are meant to uh, deal with a, with a problem of the market. The market has not been able to get to everyone, so the, the state said, okay, we will take back that responsibility and see how we can manage to do that. But the market has already did its best. To, ac to accomplish that. So in that multi-layered approach, uh, I would like to, to hear from Oscar, uh, what are your thoughts in relation to how your Universal Service Fund can be applied in innovative ways? Uh, as yesterday the ITUD uh, director mentioned, uh, uh, to apply Universal Service Funds in ways that we haven't been using it yet to cross the digital, digital gap. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, please also Sorry. try to keep your question short, so that because uh, we are running out of yes, time. Yes, sure. um, but uh, I, we took a note of USF and how to make the use of them innovative. Yes, that's um, that's one question, and uh, just to then just one other question. And uh, it's usually said like I, I really appreciate the mention of. Uh, innovative technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and such. And uh, I think it's, in, it's impressive what humanity has gone, uh, ha as far as humanity has get, got uh, in evol evolving technologies. But still half of the population is unconnected. And a lot of investment is going to these spaces, but still half of the population is unconnected. So I, I guess my question would be, um, how do we shift attention, like from OECD and also the governments, how do we put the energy in these spaces so we can work all together, not leave people behind as the, the, the process is going right now, because this conversation shouldn't be here if we thank, all thank, be connected. Thanks for the questions. Uh, we had one here. Uh, let's just collect the four of them. Um. Uh, thank you, ma Madam Chair. Ma my name is Tichafa, and I'm uh, with the telecoms regulator in Zimbabwe. Yes, we, we are in the process of uh, deploying internet connectivity to um, underserved and unserved areas at uh, schools and, um, and um, 
what we are calling community information centers. But uh, the, the challenge that we, we have had is that um, this connectivity cannot go beyond the centers themselves, but we would want to reach um, the, the, a, a wider population. So um, from what we are discussing here, I see that we, we could achieve that through the use of community networks. But how do you strike a balance uh, between covering a, a wider geographic area and um, uh, preventing uh, interference, considering that uh, most of these uh, community networks make use of uh, unlicensed bands? How, how, how do you achieve that, uh, that balance? Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a few more here. Basilis, you had a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Vasilis Chrysos, and uh, I'm from Greece. I, come, uh, I represent uh, uh, the Sarantaporo.gr community network. I would like to address a question to Oscar. Uh, Oscar, you mentioned that um, it is important uh, if we want to achieve a universal coverage uh, to uh, do some uh, to simplify the requirements for access to licensing for community networks. I understand that you have worked together with community networks in order uh, to be able to, to put it this way. And I was wondering, um, what was the critical characteristic uh, to, uh, to trust community networks and work with them? Uh, and I ask this question because from our side, we have approached our regulator um, I understand that they need to trust uh, our work, they need to trust our, our organization, and uh, I was wondering how, how do you build this trust between a community-led initiative and um, a government or a representative of the regulating body? Thank you, an excellent question. We had one more here, and then we have remote questions, I think a few. We are running out of time, so please uh, be brief. Good morning, my name is Alexandra Galaitske and I'm working as an advisor in ICT for Education with GIZ. Um, I have a question for all speakers. Um, so, if we talk about um, closing the digital gap for the marginalized, um, I think there are different dimensions that we have to look at. Um, of course, one important aspect is uh, to provide internet and co connectivity. Um, but I think another um, important reason why people are not connecting to the internet is actually not the lack of internet, but the lack of digital skills. So um, this is another important um, dimension that we have to think of, the promotion of digital skills. So to what extent do your initiatives um, take this into account? Thanks very much. And the remote questions, please, Juan. Hello, this is Gonzalo from Telefonica. If, uh, I think one of the interesting conclusions of the workshop is that uh, these initiatives would be worth to be replicated across the, all the regions. So if, if you could have a wish list, I would like you to share what would be your request for governments or for the regions so that you can replicate your initiatives uh, in other places. Thank you. Hello. Um... You stole my last question, actually, but that's, that's perfect. Um, so let's do a little round. I would also like to introduce, we have Christopher Yu from the University of Pennsylvania, who joined us a bit late. But um, please, Christopher, if you could start with brief comments, and, and then we can come down with Oscar, because you had quite a few questions and have your last remarks. Thanks. Well, thank you. And I <clears throat> offer my apologies for coming late. I had to speak at another session. We're lead, I'm leading a project in One World Connected, which is attempting to study <clears throat> the quest, um, an provide an empirical base of successful and unsuccessful interventions to connect more people to the internet. Right now, there is no data. People are speaking about opinions and uh, on business models. We actually wanted to study everything and uh, look and see what, uh, try to create a uniform information base that allows cross-project comparisons. So we now have a database of over a thousand interventions. We contacted all of them did detailed case study interviews for 120 of them, and we're now in the process of analyzing them and presenting them. So I can actually answer some of the specific questions that have come up. Uh, about disability access, there is actually only one case in our database. It's the Adaptive Technology Center for the Blind in Ethiopia, which provides a vocational training, an internet cafe, and transcription services. 
In terms of India, Sharbani is far too modest. Um, she is leading a fantastic program called Graham Marg that is quite innovative, uh, that I think is very, quite interesting. But the real comment I want to make, focus most of my comments on, someone asked, how do you get the telcos to come in? How, asked, how do we get a cooperative net, uh, relationship between the, the new innovative community networks and the existing telcos? I think this panel and the way the questions were set up for it is the sign of a new appreciation of a new relationship and a new, more creative approach to how to serve the unserved. The reality is there are large parts of the world which telephone, traditional telephone companies cannot justify serving. And you can ask them to come in, simply put, they have responsibilities to their shareholders, often legal responsibilities. It's, not, it's just not a realistic thing to ask. They have corporate social responsibility funding. They do provide some basis for doing that. But what I'm discovering is there is, can be a cooperative, symbiotic relationship between these innovative community network models and the traditional models. Because the community network models actually do not want to compete directly with traditional providers. That is not the point. Uh, they are actually trying to find ways to collaborate, to fill gaps, and in this sense, they are working to the same goals as the traditional providers in areas where the model that the traditional providers follow will not reach or will not help. And so what we can see here is a different means of uh, actually coexistence. Now, what's interesting is someone has mentioned spectrum policy. In the rural areas, spectrum is actually not as congested as it is in other areas. And there's a very nice, I, I can give you some very interesting successful models. So one of the more interesting ones is in Mexico called Rhizomatica. Rhizomatica was working in areas where the incumbent held spectrum licenses but had never built service. Uh, they were, uh, Rhizomatica was given experimental licenses and in fact qualified a micro tower cell site deployments to provide internet connectivity on a very localized basis for $3 US per month. And that's a business model that won't work for most traditional companies. Um, it needed the, um, they did this over the objection for the of the incumbent. But this is a good example where I actually think um, a reflexive opposition to someone else sharing spectrum that the incumbent is not using might not have served either the company or the industry very well. Because what the industry is recognizing that if they oppose that build, there will be increasing pressure on traditional providers to fill the gaps where they're not being served. And so trying to find new models, I hear the call for regulatory sandboxes and avoiding universal service that Christoph is talking about, filling the traditional uh, voice only, fixed line only model. I know there's another provider who's asking, why do we have to provide traditional voice in a world where everyone is doing VOIP. And, all this, and so we need to think uh, more flexibly and create a cooperative environment. But uh, the last thing I'll say is there is a different part of it, which was asked by the question by Alexandra, which is uh, it is simply not true that if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. You need digital literacy skills training. Uh, someone talked about capacity building. It's all, uh, partly on the supply side. If you build it but can't maintain it and update it, it will fail, as Christoph said. But also you need to build maker spaces, uh, local content in, uh, industries, uh, entrepreneurship networks, and build in sustainability not just on the network side, but on the demand side if you want to see the entire ecosystem succeed. And I speak from this not just out of opinion, but this is something we're seeing from the data where we actually see which ones are working and which ones are not. Excellent comments, Christopher. Thank you very much. Oscar, would you like to take the questions on the USF and innovative ways to, to use them? And also there was another one on the trust issue. So how do you build trust between community networks and, and government? Thank you. Uh, it, I think it's important you, you raise an issue about uh, uh, not only accessibility, but also affordability and digital skills. Mm -hmm. um, I focus on accessibility because it's my, my business, but I think uh, it's uh, equally important to, to deal with affordability and uh, digital skills, and I think uh, uh, some comments have been very relevant in that sense. I would like to, before answering the specific questions, to, to make a, a couple of... Uh, of general comments. I think, uh, the, first of all, what we can see from the experiences we, we have uh, shared today is uh, there is no dogmatic solution 
for uh, network access. I think that's, that's the first, as opposed to, to some previous decades where, you know, it, it was either market or state, what we have today is the lack of dogma, and that's very good news, because that allows for diversity, and the question of accessibility can be solved only if we put aside dogmas and we allow greater diversity in the telecom and network market, whatever the entities, whatever the, the structure to provide that network is. We proud ourselves in Argentina to have a very diverse environment. We have over 1,000 SMEs, we have over 500 cooperatives, we have community networks, but of course we have three large operators like almost every country in the world. And uh, I think it's important to nurture that diversity and to provide, from a regulatory standpoint, to provide solutions for all of, of the actors present in the, in the market. I agree with uh, Lorraine that uh, uh, the state is uh, subsidiary to, 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 to the provision of solutions when it comes to accessibility. The, the state cannot, there is no economic way for the state to afford accessibility for everybody in each uh, country. I think it's important to, to point that out and I have uh, mentioned that our intervention has been for small areas where the market has failed to, to, to go by itself and also in terms of backbone network because we have complemented but also we are competing in, in terms of backbone access uh, with the major telecom operators and in fact the intervention of the state in the, in the wholesale market has allowed us to have a decrease in the price of the megabyte. So those are a few of the comments and I, one, one last specific comment I wanted to make with regard to the experience uh, Christopher has shared from Peru. And uh, I think it is uh, fantastic uh, news that the platforms are getting involved in solving accessibility. I think it's important to have the major platforms, either Facebook or Google, I don't, I don't want to make names, but uh, name names, I don't know how it is in English, but I think it's name names. But uh, I think it's fantastic news that we have the involvement of the big platforms uh, to bring solutions in terms of uh, network access. We have seen that recently in the World Radio Communications Conference of the ITU, how they have been active in in uh, uh, requesting uh, innovation, uh, new technologies, and so on. Because I, I think, I s stated at the very beginning, that the accessibility is uh, an issue for all stakeholders, and everyone should contribute to the solution of this, of this problem. Uh, we will not solve half the world's population uh, problem uh, only with traditional telecom operators, that's for sure. So we, bring, we, ha we need to bring everyone on board. Now coming to the specific questions, I, I think pr part of the, the answers is already in my, my remarks. Uh, we need to be flexible in terms of uh, policy and regulatory tools. We need to, uh, there was an issue about trust. I think uh, it, Sometimes it's the other way around. Why shouldn't we trust a community that is organizing itself to provide service? And that's basically what we have, uh, we have discussed internally in Argentina. Why shouldn't we trust a, a group of people that organize itself to provide service to a community that is underserved or not served at all? Uh, that's why we simplify the licensing regime we uh, eliminated uh, licenses fees for, for community networks. I wanted to mention Nicolas is uh, from Argentina and uh, he knows uh, the community network environment and the experience we have uh, made in Argentina. Uh, behind me is uh, Esteban who uh, represents the Cabase, the Argentine Internet Association with, with more than 
500 members, and uh, that's what I referred to when I mentioned the diversity in the Argentine market. So eliminate licensing fees uh, and, and provide an easy licensing regime for community networks have, have not been a, there, there has not been a, a trust issue for us. Uh, we just have to solve sometimes uh, legalities and, and uh, keep a, a general uh, uh, sense of the regulations, but uh, we don't have a, a trust issue. On the contrary, I think uh, sometimes the state needs to change the approach and uh, see itself as a facilitator and not as a, as a policeman. We need to facilitate and, and allow innovation and development of services. And that, that I think, is the main switch uh, governments and regulators need to, to make. Uh, there is no longer a model where the, the state uh, decides who, where, and how the services are, are provided. The state now has to allow innovation, allow competition, and allow diversity and different type and kind of organizations to, to provide the broadband access uh, to, the, to the citizens. Um, I don't know if, uh, you, may, you, you asked me, Nicolas, specifically about uh, universal service funds. Um, we have done something in terms of uh, digital skills and, and affordability there. We have programs to provide uh, um, uh, uh, laptops and devices yeah. to the elderly, and also we have granted, uh, um, I don't know in English, uh, we have granted a, a fee, a monthly fee for those students that have been granted a student uh, a loan or a student subsidy. It's a very limited group of people, but we have understood that uh, it, it's a very virtuous group of people that need the support on the demand side. So that's a, a, a specific case in terms of affordability and not only uh, accessibility. Um, in terms of accessibility, yes. as I mentioned, we are working with the community networks to, to define a, a specific plan to allow them to access to funds for capital investment. We don't subsidize OPEX, we only subsidize CAPEX. But uh, sometimes when it comes to community ne networks, there, there are legal issues on the accountability or the responsibility on, on how they will be able to, to comply with the obligations involved in receiving a, a subsidy. So that's what we are trying to figure out and uh, we hope to, to be able to, to have it soon. Thank you very much for your um, comprehensive comments. We have five minutes over time, but I would like to give everybody one minute chance uh, for our speakers to just uh, share their last top of mind. And Christoph has to go, so maybe you would like to uh, state your remarks first. Yeah, and, and just very quickly, uh, a final comment. I think we hear that markets fail, and that's, that's true, but markets fail because the conditions are not right. So I think first step would be, I think, to, uh, and that, that's really a call to the governments, to be honest. Um, I understand that they cannot put you know, huge amounts of money in there for various reasons, but at least they, they should kind of rethink if the regulation is right. I think that the business of providing rural broadband connectivity is totally different from, you know, in more populated areas. It's a totally different business model, and I think we have to recognize it in regulation, and that's not done. In general, it's not done. We have, you know, nationwide regulation. And uh, there are many things you can do, taxation, because many of these costs, spectrum costs, for example, I mean, the, 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 the governments earn a lot of money with that industry, and they could kind of at least think about rural areas, how they could um, make it easier to deploy networks there. That's the first thing. And that's the same for all, eh? for community networks, operators, whatever you like. Um, I think that that's important to say as well. So if we do this regulation, apply it to everyone, and, and then let's see how competition works out. I think that's the, the, more, the most clever way of doing it. Um, I, I would just want to back to the colleague on technology. I think ultimately the whole thing will be solved by technology. 
I think ultimately, I think you can only solve connectivity to all in the world by other technologies than what we have today. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the ultimate solution. Um, there's a very interesting project, and have a look at that. I'm not going to explain it, but uh, it's called the Telecom Infra Project. Um, it's done by hundreds of small and, 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 and bigger companies. Uh, involving internet companies but also operators and um, they are working on open RAN solutions and I think that's really that's going to be the future um, and that's going to be uh, bringing down deployment costs for traditional networks a lot and then we have other kind of more kind of moonshots projects you, I mean I, I mentioned Loon we are cooperating with them already but there might be also satellite based solutions and so on I mean we have to see what's going to work best but I think that's going to be the solution in the, in the long term um, so but again uh, a call to governments to, to do a corporate effort also with everyone trying to provide for connectivity and, and think out of the box um, and then we can provide and, and do that. Ucha, your final thoughts? Any wishes for the governments or otherwise? Yes, it's very interesting and the same uh, always in every case. I just have one question and one comment about this. If you really, if the government really like to do something, very really, honestly, they have to find uh, ways to help people because it's very important and very crucial for local societies. We had the same situation for five, six years, but finally everyone understood that to create some <coughs> upscales, <coughs> we have no licensing, but anyways, licensing, frequencing, funding, helping, is not working because we have the big broadband gap. We have to avoid somehow and we are very late. So we have to find ways to help our citizens, our members, especially when they are very remote areas. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, telephone companies and carriers think they have the answers to this, and sometimes they're not based in the community. So I feel like, you know, you have some solutions, but uh, you're coming from the top down from a regulator and a, and a carrier approach, um, and you're not exactly in the community learning from the community what the needs of the community are. You have solutions, you have packages, but that is not exactly what works. And I don't know that technology will solve it all. Solve it all. You need community working together as a community to build this situation when, you know, we've been fighting for a long time to get these services and when we start to build them ourselves and maybe aren't trusted by the government because we're building something for ourselves but there is no solution otherwise, I don't think that you can come in with an approach that you have the answer. Um, I think the community probably has the answer and could use some of your tools to solve that problem. Thank you. Lorraine, any final thoughts? Um, quick thoughts on the, on the question on, on uh, emerging technologies. Uh, the point on mentioning the technologies was not at, at all to shift attention into connectivity. Quite the contrary. The idea was to, to uh, try to understand how these technologies are actually uh, changing and shifting uh, the sector in itself. And uh, what we've been trying to do, at least in OECD, our team, is to try to bring attention back to the issue of connectivity. It's very sexy to talk about the digital transformation and AI and all the different technologies going around. <laughs> and we are the ones uh, uh, actually saying, you actually need cables and you need that uh, you need infrastructure to be able to provide the foundation for the digital transformation and uh, and my wish list for for governments is one collect data um, two simplify and and three innovate uh, with uh, people at the center so yeah. thank you very clear very punchy Sharbani um, I would like to focus uh, that uh, that uh, connectivity after after putting in so much of hardships in enabling connectivity to the unconnected. Uh, it's very sad to see that the connectivity died down within a year or so because it's not sustainable over there. So I think uh, the thing is that we should really work towards making it sustainable first and try to understand how we should make it sustainable. So that's something that I would really like to focus on. And I, and I, I think also in, in India, the BharatNet project, which is uh, the optical fiber project that the government of India is uh, 
uh, laying, the optical fiber it's laying. Um, it's also reaching an unsustainable uh, future because, uh, because then there is no sustainability at the, at the last mile. So that's also uh, dying down. So I think we should focus on sustainability of the connectivity and try to make it as sustainable as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just the final word from my side. Um, you have one more sentence to add. Apparently, we have to leave the room. I want to congratulate Asia and Etno because there's a real opportunity here to change the attitudes about how the different parts of the industry work together, whether it's government, community networks, traditional providers. And I hope everyone in this room seizes that opportunity to put us on a more constructive footing that will actually serve the goal which we all have, which is trying to extend the benefits of internet connectivity to everyone in the world. Yeah, and just on behalf of uh, Etno from our side, and also I think I can uh, talk on behalf of ASIAT, so we wanted to indeed to organize this event to also express our willingness to be part of this dialogue and, and to confirm that we are open for collaboration to, to, remote, uh, to, to connect remote areas and uh, underserved areas. So thank you everybody for your kind contributions and uh, to our speakers. Um, thank you.